Today, join us as we make the invisible visible. I feel like I made it come to life. Yeah. From levitating magnets. Go, little guy. Go. To harnessing the power of wind for a fire tornado. It is so perfect. Keep those eyes peeled. You don't want to miss this. I'm Nick Uhas. Welcome to Ugly Satisfying Science. As a scientist, I'm on a singular mission to find the coolest experiments the world has to offer. Wow. <laughs> and see how they can improve our everyday lives. That looks like magic. With the help of some expert friends, we'll discover the secrets of the universe one awesome explosion at a time. Seriously, do not try this at home. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. Have you ever heard that seeing is believing? Well, I'm not a big fan of that cliche. I believe in viruses, even when I can't see them. I mean, I believe in unicorns too, but <laughs> that's only because narwhals already exist. But okay, all right, like I'm getting off track. Our world is full of energy, waves and forces we cannot see, although we know they exist, like sound waves and magnetism, even gravity. In this episode, we're gonna take a closer look at some invisible phenomena, starting with resonance. In November 1940, a four-month-old bridge in Tacoma, Washington, was felled by our invisible friend in the sky, wind. But the 42-mile-an-hour wind that took down the bridge was otherwise only strong enough to snap some small branches. You can see from people in the clip that they're walking around easily without threat from the wind. So how did a breeze cause a brand new bridge to collapse? The mile-long overpass was built to be highly flexible, but when wind began oscillating the road, instead of absorbing and dissipating the vibrations, the bridge collected this vibrating momentum, ramping up its oscillations until it hit a breaking point. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster is an example of resonance gone wild. It's a phenomenon we're gonna have some fun with now. Hey, Nick. What's up, Cole? This is my friend Cole. He is a chemistry guru. Cole, what do you have for me today? Well, today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about resonant frequencies. Okay. So resonant frequencies are a very complicated mathematical and scientific concept but basically they refer to the way an object will vibrate under some kind of an external force, okay. right? So when you apply an external force to uh, an object, you can get it to vibrate in different ways. And every object based on the material properties of whatever it's made out of is going to prefer to vibrate at a specific frequency. And when the external force matches that frequency, we call it a resonant frequency. Lost, me too. Think of it like pushing a swing. Each swing has its own natural arc. If you stand at the midpoint of its arc and push, the swing won't go very high because you're absorbing its movement, interrupting its flow and shortening its path. But if you step back and push the swing when it's at its highest point, you add a little bit of energy to each oscillation, making each swing slightly bigger than the next. In the case of the Tacoma Bridge, once the wind began to rock the bridge, it continued to push at intervals that amplified the road's bouncing until the structure literally ripped itself apart. So it's the external force is essentially adding energy to this wavelength. Exactly. And then that's actually making the amplitude grow. Correct. So we get a bigger result. Exactly. Do I have a resonant frequency? You do, actually. Oh. Any matter has a resonant frequency, and scientists have figured out that human beings and all of their meat are about 10 hertz, give or take. <laughs> What? Yeah. That's crazy. So it's not like if we played a 10 hertz sine wave at you that you would explode, but <laughs> all of the cells in your body would begin to vibrate in a way that is consistent with their resonant frequency. Wow. And theoretically, if done for long enough, it could probably cause some kind of cell damage. Wow. Yeah. Okay. This isn't a body though. No exploding humans today. We're gonna be taking a look at something called a spouting bowl. So the way that this bowl works is uh, through something called slip stick friction. Basically, as we rub along these brass handles, your hands are going to undergo this process of sticking due to friction and then slipping and catching again. It's going to create this frequency that's gonna vibrate throughout the bowl. And when you get the pressure and the slip friction and the, the timing just right to the resonant frequency of the bowl, you can start to see that resonant frequency as it is exemplified here in the water. What I'm gonna have you do is dip your palms into the water and then you're gonna rub them back and forth on these brass handles here. And you wanna go for kind of medium light pressure and okay. we're gonna see what happens. All right, so into the water. Yeah. All right. 
hands on yep. these and then, and then push back and forth. Okay, so I'm hearing a sound. Yep, keep doing that and look what starts Ooh. happening. <laughs> well, I feel, I feel like I made it come to life. Yeah, keep All doing right. it. Whoa, it's like, it's like talking to me. I'm the water resonance master. There we go. I got it really good there for a second. <laughs> it's hard to get right. It's surprisingly hard to do. Even though it's vibrating, how does it end up, you know, the water sort of jumping back at you? Yeah, so this is an effect uh, in acoustics called constructive interference. Basically, when you have two waves uh, that overlay each other, their peaks add up and their valleys also add up. So it's like together we're stronger. Exactly. And then when you're together, then you have this like super wave. Right, so and what's happening when the water jumps out at you there is you're matching the resonant frequency of the bowl, and because of these nodes that you can see around the bowl, you'll notice that the vibrations form at specific points. Yeah, like on back here. Exactly. You start getting this pattern, and when the constructive interference allows for it, the water ends up getting enough energy that it can leap up out of the bowl and spout. Is this kind of the same thing when like someone's yelling at a wine glass and then it just breaks? Yeah, absolutely. So the classic image of like an opera singer singing into a glass and then having it shatter is a fantastic demonstration of resonant frequency and it is something that is legitimately possible. And I've heard that you need to be over around 115 decibels. Yes. And by the way, that's incredibly loud. It's that's very actually loud. so loud that that would damage your hearing. Yep. Um, your eardrums. So that's like listening to a car stereo on full blast. Hence why it's so difficult. Cole, thank you so much for teaching me all about resonant frequencies. Um, and also, I really enjoyed this. This was actually really therapeutic to do. Yeah, it's really fun to do, which is why I'm gonna take this one. Okay, yeah, me. why don't you go ahead and just get on there. All right, well, I'll see ya. Bye. Um, enjoy the resonant frequencies while I... I'll be right here when you get back. And now, it's time for some simple science with my engineering friend, Maynard. Today, we're going to talk about magnetism, specifically compasses. That's right, a compass is a magnet. Each end of the needle in a compass is treated to seek the magnetic pools of the Earth. That's why no matter where you are on the planet, a compass can always point you in the right direction. They're the ultimate travel friend, so I thought, why not show y'all how you can make a compass? Perhaps the most famous story about homemade compasses comes from March 24, 1944, when 76 Allied prisoners of war made a daring escape from a German prison camp using makeshift compasses made of magnetized razor blades and cardboard. The feat was quite impressive. You're going to need a magnet, a cork, and some water, and also a piece of metal. I'm using this Allen wrench, but you can use any metal that can hold a charge. Your best bets are likely pieces made of iron, steel, or nickel, but don't let me limit your imagination. The magnet I have here is a fridge magnet, but it's also Yuhas approved. Pretty attractive, but not like yours truly. It only has one side to it, and right now I don't know if it's a north or south pole, but we'll be able to find out in a minute. First, you're going to take your wrench and your magnet and carefully rub one pull of the magnet on one end of the wrench, moving in one direction only, around 20 to 50 times. Now, by rubbing the magnet over the steel, we are actually changing the orientation of the charges inside the wrench's atoms. Once they've been rearranged, they start searching for something they're attracted to. In this case, they're attracted to the magnetic pull of one of the Earth's poles. It's still okay if you don't know which pool you're magnetizing to, because we'll find out soon. Now, once your metal is magnetized, carefully lay it on a piece of cork, like so. Bam. Now watch as your metal orients itself towards the appropriate poles. The water is just a medium for our compass to sit on. It's not actually impacting the magnetic pole, as you can see. Can you see how this end of the wrench is always wanting to point that way? Since I'm familiar with this location, I already know that this end is pointing north. But if you ever find yourself making a compass in a place where you can't tell which is the north or south, use context clues. Remember, the sun always rises in the east and sets in the west. And the directions go, never eat shredded wheat. Or some might say, never eat soggy waffles, but uh, I kinda like soggy waffles. 
If you're a breakfast fan or not, this experiment is a simple way that you can use science to always find your way home. Back to you, Nick. Maynard's magnets have me thinking. You ever wish that you had a hoverboard? And I don't mean those toys you see people rolling around on. I mean the real deal. You know, a personal transportation device that legitimately hovers over the ground using nothing but science to keep it afloat? I want the feeling of flight without the effort of flapping, the wind rushing through my hair without the nightmare of being up in the clouds. What, I'm, I'm afraid of heights. Okay, so while my Back to the Future dreams may not be a rideable reality just yet, my friend Kat says that with the invisible force of magnetism, she can get pretty close. What's up, Kat? Kat is my good friend. She's an electrical engineer and she worked at NASA. Kat, what do you have in store for me today? Well, have you ever heard of something called quantum locking? I have not. Okay, well, after today, you're gonna be very well versed. Well, that's awesome, but what is it? So essentially, it's an effect that under the right conditions can affect magnetic fields. Oh. Walk me through, what are the things on the table here? Okay, so this is the experiment we have for today. We have liquid nitrogen in here, okay. so be very careful with that. Yep. We have magnets, which you're familiar with these magnets. Neodymium. Yeah. We have some more magnets up here oh, yeah. to create a track. Cool. And here, this is called YBCO, yttrium barium copper oxide. YBCO is a compound of soft elemental metals with oxygen. It's known as a superconductor because it transmits electricity or allows electrons to move from atom to atom with practically no resistance. Now, something that's really special about superconductors is that they actually repel magnetic field. When the YBCO is cooled to negative 292 degrees Fahrenheit, the electrons in the puck begin to move in a way that negates, even repels, nearby magnetic fields. This is known as the Meissner effect. So when we put the magnet over it and it repels it, it's going to appear to levitate. Got it. Basically, I guess the first step is we need to get that thing really cold. Exactly. I have these thermal gloves down here. Yeah, that is very important because the liquid nitrogen is super cold. <laughs> To achieve the Meissner effect, we give the YBCO a liquid nitrogen bath, which runs a frigid negative 321 degrees Fahrenheit. I love this part. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> okay. It is certainly cold. Yes, it is. It's actually boiling liquid nitrogen because the, the puck was so hot. I think it's about ready. Okay. So should we try it? Should we put the magnet on there? Yes, we should. Here, you should do it since okay. you're the one wearing the gloves. All right, copy that. I am so excited for this. Oh! What? <laughs> it is legitimately off yes, the puck. it is. It is actually levitating. <laughs> if I just like push the backside, I bet you I could get it to rotate. Yes, I think you can. You can do it so gently. Yeah. Oh! What? Oh, that doesn't even look, that is crazy. <laughs> that looks like magic. So what we're seeing here is the quantum locking. Now keep in mind, this magnet is extremely strong. So here what we're experiencing is the attractive and the repelling forces basically fighting against each other to create this levitation effect. While our superconductor hasn't become magnetic, the electrons inside it are moving in a way that mimics a repellent magnetic force. In essence, because the neodymium's magnetic field cannot penetrate the superconductor, it forces the magnet into the air instead. That's pretty amazing that it's even essentially counteracting the effect of gravity. Yeah, so gravity actually at the subatomic level is pretty weak, and this superconductor is very, very strong, so it'll always win the battle. Wow. Now are you ready for the next thing? Uh, yes. Okay, so here what we're gonna do is the reverse. Okay. So instead of putting the magnet on the YBCO to make it levitate, uh -huh. we're gonna put the YBCO on this track of magnets and see if the YBCO levitates this time. All right, still got some liquid nitrogen yeah, on it. Yeah, perfect. All right, and... Oh! oh! Go, little guy! Go, go! <laughs> you can do it! <laughs> see, look at that! I got my cross! 
So now, Nick, imagine this at a much grander scale. There are actually trains that use magnetic levitation. Oh, yeah, like the Shinkansen in Japan. <laughs> exactly. Or the maglev train in Shanghai. Yes. They're like, kind of like all the same kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. Although they're not using liquid nitrogen. No, but what they do do is use superconductors and magnets to create a frictionless track. Kat, thank you so much. This is so cool, literally. I think this is the closest I've ever been to a real hoverboard. It's my pleasure, Nick. It's not just pressure waves, gravity, or magnetism that affect our everyday lives. There are a lot of invisible chemical forces we all feel on a daily basis that impact us, like pheromones. A pheromone is a chemical substance that mammals, insects, and plants produce to affect the behavior of other members of its species. They're similar to hormones, except instead of feeling their effects internally, pheromones are sent outwards to other members of the species as an invitation or a warning. Because pheromones travel mostly by air, they remain effective even over long distances. And unlike sound or light waves, which move in a straight line, pheromones travel through diffusion, so they can travel in many directions all at once. Social insects, or those that live in colonies like termites, wasps, and ants, use pheromones to communicate about everything, from mating to where food is located, even alerting others about nearby predators. Plants use pheromones too. The Funiculum vulgari, more commonly known as the fennel plant, produces a pheromone that actually limits the growth of other plants around it. Meanwhile, fruits like tomatoes, apples, and bananas are all ripened on the vine when their parent plants secrete the pheromone ethylene. Humans give off loads of pheromones too, but what each pheromone is or how it impacts a recipient seems to depend heavily on the person smelling it. While we know a lot about insect and plant pheromones, scientists are still working to discover what many human release pheromones do or what their intended messages for others may be. So the next time you find yourself attracted to someone and can't quite place your finger on why, it might be because of the invisible impact of pheromones. For our last invisible force today, I wanna to circle back around to wind. I'm still in disbelief that a little breeze took down the Tacoma Bridge. Like, what can't wind do? It creates waves in the oceans, has powered Holland's iconic windmills since the 13th century, and my personal favorite, it can create a tornado. And what better way to understand how wind whips up a cyclone than by creating a fire vortex? The same way that wind can whip up different types of tornadoes, a spinning wall of fire can be many different things. From a fire whirl, like the ones in the August 2020 Loyalton fire in California, to a full-on fire tornado, like the ones from the car fire in August 2018. With winds in excess of 140 miles per hour, the flames from this tornado reached over 40,000 feet. That's higher than a commercial jet flies. It's time to scale up our science. Let's take this outside. Fire tornado, let's do this. All right, so here's what we're gonna need for this. First, safety is the number one priority, so I have these fire-resistant gloves. That feels good, that feels like safety, actually. <laughs> Now, in order to have fire, we need something to actually burn. And so I have isopropyl alcohol right here, also known as rubbing alcohol. The other thing that we have here is we have a lighter. I have a Lazy Susan, <laughs> which you guys probably have no idea what that is. But back in the day, when you would sit down uh, with your family for dinner, you would have this thing in the middle that would actually rotate the condiments like salt and pepper. We also have this um, can. This is just something to hold our fuel in. But let's do this. Let's just think about fire tornado. How do we make a fire tornado? We get the fire spinning. So let's try that. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put some of this ice purple alcohol into this little can right here. We don't need a ton, because what's actually burning is the vapor. It's not the actual liquid itself. Okay, let's see what happens. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and light this up. All right, 
So we can see the fire. That is a pretty good fire, actually. That's pretty good. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna rotate it. And we're gonna get a fire tornado. Here we go. All right, in three, two, fire tornado! Fire tornado! Okay, all right, there's obviously a problem here. We are not getting a fire tornado at all. We're not getting this calm effect. I'm not, I'm not getting this really cool, what I want to see, this fire whirl. Why isn't this happening? What we're missing is wind shear. Wind shear is when the wind changes in speed and direction over a very short distance. This is generally caused by some external force, like surface obstructions that block wind. But it can also happen when pockets of low pressure air get caught in higher pressure air. To create the conditions for a pressure differential, we need a simple mesh trash can. I'm gonna go ahead and put this down on our Lazy Susan, and I'm gonna go ahead and put our ice purple alcohol right down in there. And so I'm just gonna get in here and light this up. There's our fire, there's our fuel burning, her nice beautiful combustion. All right, now here we go. Fire tornado, take two. Fire tornado. Okay, we're getting a little bit of a vortex there. There's a little bit of air. I can actually feel it blowing behind me. Oh, did you see that? Look at this, look, look. It's actually happening. This, there we go. Look at this. Spinning a little bit more. Look at this. I am a magician. I am basically one with the fire tornado. That is a really great column. There we go, wow, wow, wow. Okay, here's what's happening. By adding the trash can around the fire, we've helped collect a small pocket of warm air that didn't exist before. Essentially the hot air is rising and so it's pulling the air upward this way. When I'm rotating it like this, these tiny little holes are allowing cold air to come in through the sides down here and it's fueling the fire in a column as it's spinning up. I'm really impressed with our fire tornado, but I feel like we should go bigger. All right, so we're, uh, we're definitely going bigger for this one. I have a ignition source and I have some gasoline. Now, this is extremely dangerous. Do not try this at home whatsoever. I'm gonna light this actually outside of what I'm calling the ring of fire. If you look around me, there's 10 fans. This is kind of replicating our trash can. It's gonna be able to bring that really cool air and it's gonna force this hot air right next to itself in order to create a pressure stream that creates a vortex that is essentially gonna create our fire tornado. <laughs> All right, guys, let's do this. Okie dokie. I'm gonna go ahead and light this first from way far back. We have fire, excellent. Let's turn these fans on. Now there's gonna be some readjusting here. So it looks like we're getting too much wind on one side. Create more vortex this direction. I need this actually closer, yep. Oh, oh, it's starting to do it. We got plenty of flame now. We just need the vortex. All right, here we go. Fire tornado in three, two, one. Oh, oh it is so perfect. Look at that. Oh my God, it's still going. That, wow, wow, you can see it. It, it just kind of like comes up, wow. Like I am speechless. That literally works so perfectly. It was certainly oddly satisfying. Maybe too oddly satisfying for me. <laughs> but what an awesome thing that we learned all about fire tornadoes and fire vortexes, both in nature and a demo that you can do at home. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Nick Haas. This is Oddly Satisfying Science. We'll see you on the next one.